tonight, visceral reaction after the Prime Minister's change in language on Israel's war in Gaza. People are frustrated because Canada has not taken that position. What the deepening divisions reveal. David Cochran with analysis. Israel's military show the guns they say they found in a Gaza hospital. A live grenade, ammunition, fighting vest. Why Israel won't allow new supplies of fuel to reach hospitals. Home sales get an early jump on their annual winter slowdown. This is a market that now is trying to cope and adjust to, to higher interest rates. Volume may be down, but not prices. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. The war between Hamas and Israel is half a world away, yet so very personal for many living in this country. And their disagreement over what Canada should do and say is landing at the Prime Minister's doorstep. What he says and how he says it are being watched closely by a divided and passionate population. Demands he called for a ceasefire countered instantly by demands he support Israel. He's heard both in the last 24 hours, loud and clear, after a speech he made in B.C. yesterday. As Rafi Bujikanian shows us, it angered many in many different ways, both here at home and in Israel. The, remains of the change in the prime minister's language was noticeable. I urge the government of Israel to exercise maximum restraint. The Tuesday comments followed days of dire news from Gaza. The world is witnessing this, the killing of women and children, of babies. This has to stop. The reaction from Israel's prime minister was swift. It is not Israel that is deliberately targeting civilians, but Hamas, Benjamin Netanyahu wrote in rebuke. The forces of civilization must back Israel. But for many in this country, Trudeau's new language fell short. Hours later, some 250 protesters gathered outside the Vancouver restaurant he was in, then within it. People are frustrated because Canada has not taken that position. Justin Trudeau has not taken that position. That frustration underscoring a deep divide over how Canada should respond to the Israel-Hamas war. Differing views united by a common thought that what Canada says is important because Israel is listening. Some community groups say the prime minister's language is a step in the right direction but falls short. But we need to see more. Canada needs to take a leading role internationally in terms of advocating for a ceasefire. Others say the prime minister's words missed a crucial point. With the accusation of Israel killing um, of women, killing of, uh, of children, killing of babies, uh, really was something that did not um, properly contextualize um, how we got here. The debates divided Parliament too. Conservatives and most Liberals are not calling for a ceasefire, but the NDP and the Bloc Québécois do want to see one. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. Let's talk a little more about this with David Cochran, host of Power and Politics. So, David, how does the Prime Minister navigate an issue like this politically? Well, Adrian, the Liberals are in a very difficult position here for a number of reasons. There's no middle ground position that Justin Trudeau can take that will satisfy the anger and the pain and the fear that we're seeing across the country. And, and if you look at where the anti-Semitic incidents have happened, it's in large urban centers. If you look at the large pro-Palestinian rallies, it's in the large urban centers. Well, the Liberal Party is the party of the large urban centers and the suburbs of Canada. So the fault lines of this conflict runs right through the Liberal caucus and the Liberal political base. And it's happening with the Liberal Party at its lowest point in popularity since their 2015 win. And at a moment, Adrian, where the demographic and generational changes in the country over the last few decades ha have really shifted the consensus when it comes to this particular conflict. So this will be an enormous test for political leaders as this goes on. And what are you watching for next? There must be so much. 
Yeah, I want to see where public opinion goes. It's been shifting. The most recent data we have shows a pretty divided country, which isn't a surprise. But we're seeing fresh data out of the United States from a poll Reuters News has done, and it suggests that support for Israel in the United States is dropping, while the desire for a ceasefire is growing. So this is happening with Israel's staunchest and most important ally. So as this conflict drags, the body count grows. What does that do to the public mood? And then how does that drive what political leaders say and do? All right, thank you. That's David Cochran in Ottawa. Thank you. Now, inside Gaza, fighting does indeed continue tonight. Israeli troops spent the day inside Gaza's largest hospital. And as Ellen Morrow shows us, they're making the public case that Hamas was once there too. So we're inside the MRI center of the Shifa hospital. This video, Israel's military claims, proves Hamas fighters operated inside Gaza's Al Shifa hospital. Ammunition, fighting vest with insignia. Boots and, of course, uniforms, and last but not least, standard AK-47. The military says it uncovered these weapons, but so far, no public evidence of the Hamas headquarters Israel alleges is underneath the large compound. Israeli troops moved into Al-Shifa overnight after days of fierce fighting around it. The Hamas-run health ministry claims this is the aftermath of an Israeli strike before the raid. Smoke, dust, anxiety, as young patients try to hang on to life. Everyone got really, really terrified and felt the situation was really difficult. It's totally a scary situation. It's continuous shooting from the tanks. Israel says troops delivered baby food, incubators, and other medical supplies. But the most vulnerable of all remain at the hospital in a perilous limbo. So do hundreds of others, doctors say. Shifa means healing in Arabic, but the hospital has been a scene of suffering. We have had no contact since last night with anyone at Al Shifa Hospital. Dr. Omar Abdel Manan has worked in Al Shifa and knows many of the doctors there. I honestly um, could not go to sleep, and I was pretty terrified and horrified by the idea of uh, military personnel and specialist units going in. While the World Health Organization condemned the raid, Israel's prime minister hailed it, his vow to wipe out Hamas after the October 7th attacks. There is no place in Gaza that we will not reach, Benjamin Netanyahu says. There is no hiding for Hamas. At the Rafah border crossing with Egypt, some fuel now trickling in, but only United Nations trucks allowed to use it. None will be sent to Gaza's ailing hospitals, begging for fuel to keep life-saving equipment going. Israel fears it will end up being taken by Hamas. At this hospital in central Gaza, no one escapes the suffering. These children, their parents say, injured in an Israeli airstrike. Suddenly, the rocket hit the floor above us, this man says. Three of his kids, he adds, are missing. Outside, a ritual all too common now, yet more families plunged into mourning. So, Ellen, as you mentioned, some fuel is getting into Gaza. What's your sense of what sort of difference it will make? Well, likely not very much. We're talking about 23,000 liters only to be used by U.N. trucks bringing aid in. Uh, the U.N. aid agency in Gaza says that's only about 9% of what's actually needed to sustain what it called life-saving activities. And it's not clear, Adrian, when more fuel will be allowed in. All right, Ellen Morrow in Jerusalem for us tonight. Thank you. You're welcome. The United States and China are pledging to restore crucial military contact tonight after a high-stakes meeting at the APEC summit. While Presidents Biden and Xi still disagree on a lot, both say dialogue is the only way forward. Ashley Burke is in San Francisco tonight. After a year of silence, the leaders of the world's two superpowers face-to-face. -face. I think it's paramount that you and I understand each other clearly, leader to leader. Both U.S. President Joe Biden and China's President Xi Jinping acknowledged the meeting's importance. We know each other for a long time. We haven't always agreed, which was not a surprise to anyone. But our meetings have always been candid, straightforward, and useful. 
President Xi called the U.S.-China relationship the most important in the world and said despite challenges, turning their backs on each other is not an option. With conflicts in the Middle East and Ukraine and tensions over Taiwan, which Xi called the most dangerous issue between the two countries, both sides agreed to restore contact between their militaries. Vital miscalculations on either side can, uh, can cause real, real trouble with, a, with a, uh, a country like China. A move to help avoid miscommunication that could cause another conflict. No one wants to see escalation of tensions in South China Sea or East China Sea over Taiwan issues. The U.S. has reported frequent and dangerous close calls from China's planes and ships in or over the South China Sea. Canada has two. You have entered China's contiguous zone. CBC News filmed these Chinese warships shadowing HMCS Ottawa in the Taiwan Strait. It's a reason why the uh, military have to, to speak to avoid uh, incidents at sea or in the air. The Prime Minister arrived in San Francisco Wednesday. So far, he and she are not scheduled to have a formal meeting. But Justin Trudeau says he'll continue to engage with China on issues like climate change while also challenging Beijing. Our issues around respect for human rights, uh, these are things that we will continue to bring up. Experts say it would be too politically risky for the government to change its tone and appear soft on China at a time when it's continuing to investigate allegations of Chinese foreign interference in the past two elections. Ashley Burke, CBC News, San Francisco. And the Prime Minister flew to San Francisco for that summit on the government's new jet, its first official trip since entering service. The Airbus A330 and another one just like it cost about $140 million Canadian for both of them, purchased from Kuwait to replace Ottawa's aging fleet. They're bigger, with a longer range than the old A310 that broke down two months ago, stranding Trudeau in India. Toronto police say a man is in custody tonight facing a murder charge. Three people were struck by a car in an apartment complex's parking lot. A woman in her 60s was killed. A man and an elderly woman have serious but non-life-threatening injuries. Police say the victims and the suspect had a familial relationship. CBC News spoke with a man who says he saw the incident from his balcony and he says the car struck the woman who was killed multiple times. I heard screaming. Multiple people screaming. I came outside then, and that white SUV there was driving towards that staircase that goes up to the north lobby. That witness also says he heard a loud argument before the victims were struck. Earlier today, Greg Ross spoke with others at the scene at a time when police were reporting three injured, not two. Somebody screaming, help, help, help. Rudy Vecto was in his apartment when he heard the screams. He says he ran outside to see what was happening. I seen this lady on, on the ground. She was, didn't move at all. The lady who was lying here in the middle, uh, she was totally full of blood, you know, and totally out. Police say that woman and three other people were hit by a car in the parking lot of this apartment complex. It was determined that four people were struck by a single motor vehicle. Three of those people were transported to hospital and one of them was treated at the scene. One of those people, a woman, later died in hospital. Injuries to the other two people are considered non-life-threatening. Vectel says he saw a man sitting behind the wheel of this white car who made no attempt to help the victims. The driver was sitting in the car. He could have driven out easily because there was nobody, no ambulance here, no police here. You could have just easily driven out but he was just sitting in the car. This cell phone video provided by one of the residents shows the man Vectel says was in the white car being arrested after police arrived on scene. There is some information that these people were struck intentionally and that's why homicide is investigating. Multiple residents have told us that the man police arrested also lives here in the apartment complex. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. New real estate numbers show a decline in Canadian home sales, even as prices rose slightly. So in October, the actual national average home price was $656,000. That's up 1.8% from October of 2022. Anise Dari has been looking into the latest housing market data and the impact of high interest rates. 
Canada's real estate market is hibernating early. Home sales taking their usual pre-winter slump already in October, at least according to the Canadian Real Estate Association. Fewer homes were listed month over month, the first drop since March. Average prices are up compared to last year, 2% nationally, 2.7% in Ontario, 3.9% in BC, 5.1% in Alberta. But industry players say signs of a slowdown are everywhere. It's funny, a year ago, the int um, sales are up 17%, but what we've seen overall, the trend has leveled out. We've seen it right now, we're not as many multiple offers. Even with record high prices, Calgary's market isn't immune. People are going to be more waiting to see what's going to happen in February, March with the interest rates and what, what our economy is going to do. Higher interest rates mean higher monthly mortgage payments. Some buyers may be waiting for those to drop. This is a market that now is, you know, uh, trying to cope and adjust to, to higher interest rate and it's going to take some, no, some time probably into, the, into next year to, uh, to fully adjust. Sellers are adjusting too, and in some cases, staying put. The number of new listings relative to sales is the lowest in a decade. But prices may not fall because Canada's population keeps increasing faster than housing supply. We're likely to see the reappearance of those very, very you know, strong tensions between what you know, very you know, the strong demand is uh, from population growth and our ability to uh, produce enough housing units to accommodate that, that growth. The Canadian Real Estate Association says it thinks sellers might be holding off until the spring, though even with a slowdown, prices aren't plummeting. So affordability is still a concern for many. Anise Hidari, CBC News, Calgary. A frightening situation unfolded on an Air Canada flight as it made a precarious landing. It literally took my breath away because it was terrifying. A passenger on board tells us what it was like as the plane started to shake. A country already on the brink of famine now dealing with devastating floods. But first, the son of an Israeli-Canadian killed by Hamas speaks about the shocking discovery. I hope her death will be a part of some new movement, some change. We're back in two. Israeli-Canadian Vivian Silver championed peace and worked alongside Palestinians for years, hoping to achieve it. After Hamas's attack on October the 7th, many feared she'd been kidnapped. We now know she was killed that terrible day. It took more than a month to identify her remains. That is a long time to have no idea what happened to your mom. In the early days, as confusion reigned, her son, Jonathan Zeigen, was gracious enough to speak with us. Tonight, he's doing so again as he prepares for her funeral Thursday. We're all so sorry about your mom. I feel like strangers, Canadians in particular, have gotten to know your mom a little bit. I don't know if you have felt the concern or, in some cases, a love for her. Yeah, I did feel it. I felt Canadians in particular really felt that they're involved and um, took her persona to heart, mm -hmm. and I was moved by it. In the first few days after we met, when we were talking about your mom, you were in that awful place of not knowing. Did they leave you to believe that they had any indication that she had been taken? She was considered kidnapped, but there wasn't any concrete indication mm -hmm. other than her phone being uh, geolocated in Gaza. And I remember you saying that you had wanted to somehow get to the kibbutz. Was there ever an option for you to go? Yeah, I did go. I think it was uh, November 2nd. I managed to salvage a few small sculptures that hadn't been uh, burnt. Uh, but everything was uh, ashes there. I'm not sure when they were able to, to extract remains from the house if it if they did it on the first few days before anybody else came in or or did we miss it I'm sorry you have those pictures in your head Yeah 
pictures. So many pictures in the last month have been of hostages. Vivian Silver's beaming face was on so many of those posters, and those family members have become a large, complicated and vocal presence in Israel. It's a bit like a microcosmos of the Israeli society because different people, different kinds of people got uh, kidnapped. The uh, formal messages of the family forum, I, I wasn't really in line with it. How so, Jonathan? Well, it seemed like the majority believed that we have to get the hostages out, but keep on the war. And I thought those are contradicting messages. We are also missing the moral stance of war as a crime in itself, and that we had to view October 7th as a wake-up call that military force isn't a solution for anything. I think that uh, without outside intervention, um, things will get worse before they get better for Israelis and Palestinians. You know, this situation we got to is a joint failure of so many years. Vivian Silver's funeral will be Thursday. Closure, he calls it, on the matter of her life and death, that is, but not at all in terms of comfort or grief. I think in the bigger picture, there won't be closure until we have peace in the region. Is there something your mom taught you in particular that, that is really present for you right now? The ability to remain with a strong and assertive center of uh, your beliefs, and in the same time, stay kind and empathetic. Most of us want their deaths to have meaning, like our lives. And I hope her death will be a part of some new movement, some change in our reality. Sounds like that would matter to her. May her memory be a blessing to you, and thank you for making thank you. time. Thank, thank you. you. Vivian was from Canada, but had lived in Israel for decades. And in the 70s, she helped found a kibbutz there. That is where she will be remembered Thursday at her funeral. But there are dozens of other families holding out hope that their loved ones are still alive after being taken by Hamas. I don't even want to start imagining the worst case scenario um, because I have to stay strong and fight for them. Their desperate appeals to see their families released. The jury is now deliberating in the Nathaniel Veltman trial, but there are details they never heard. Obviously, for what I did, obviously, I'm going to have His plans to target others, including at a hospital. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. Devastating floods have hit Somalia, impacting millions of people, many forced from their homes as the water rises, others afraid to leave because of the danger lurking under the surface. Iva Musa shows us scenes of a worsening disaster. In southern Somalia, roads turned into rivers. We can't bring goods by plane, says this shop owner. There is a serious shortage of goods, fuel and food. Another disaster just a year after severe drought brought Somalia to the brink of famine. Now heavy rains are causing extreme flooding in what the UN calls a once-in-a-century event, threatening the lives and livelihoods of at least 4.3 million people. UN officials now warn a quarter of the country's population face crisis-level hunger or worse by year's end. And that's not the only danger. We can't go to some of the places in town, says this local resident. Because of the high water levels, we are afraid of crocodiles and other animals in the water. Officials say the flooding has already killed dozens and displaced nearly half a million people. And it could get worse as Somalia's heavy seasonal downpours are made worse by El Nino, a climate pattern typically associated with increased rainfall in the Horn of Africa. Somalia is a country at the, at the sharp edge of climate change, despite scarcely contributing any emissions itself. 
Droughts, floods, tropical storms are all too common. And they're a big driver of the humanitarian crisis there. What we've really seen this year and across the last couple of years is just that pattern dialed up to 11, taken to the worst extremes. The UN has released 25 million US dollars in emergency aid, but officials say Somalia needs more than money. It needs sustained international help to adapt and withstand the effects of climate change in the future. Idil Musa, CBC News, Toronto. Now we go deeper in the story shaping our world. Families of hostages try to keep hope alive. But first, a unique murder trial is wrapping up. This is The Breakdown. A jury is now deciding whether Nathaniel Veltman murdered a Muslim family in the name of terror. I, it was me. It was me, it was me that did it. Now come arrest me. We review what was heard in court and also what wasn't, like these calculations for killing. This is an incredibly important moment. Muslim Canadians in particular now waiting for a verdict that could make history. And that verdict could come any day now. Here's Thomas Daglin to break down key evidence, some now made public for the very first time. By the time an avowed white nationalist with a cross spray painted on his t-shirt was being searched by London, Ontario police, he had attacked a Muslim family of five. Four were dead, and the killer was in the mood to talk. Obviously for what I did, obviously I'm gonna have More than two years later, a jury has been shown hours of video evidence. I want the world to know why I did what I did. Seen pictures from inside his apartment and heard weeks of testimony. The defense even called the attacker as a witness. Their shock as people wonder where exactly this is going. Now, will Nathaniel Veltman be convicted of terrorism motivated murder? Here's what jurors saw and what they didn't see. The night before the attack, Veltman testified he hit the road to Toronto. His mind in a dreamlike state, still reeling from a magic mushroom trip. When he said he came upon a group of Muslims, he felt an urge to run them over. But the jury didn't hear there's evidence Veltman had another target in mind as well. Prosecutors revealed directions to Toronto's Women's College Hospital were found on Veltman's smartphone. He had mused about attacking abortion providers, had a bag of weapons in his truck, and repeatedly viewed the writings of the man behind the deadly New Zealand mosque shootings. They can end up believing that anything can be a threat. Vanderbilt University professor Sophie Bjork James has done extensive research on the white nationalist movement. When people enact this kind of terrorist violence, they want to become heroes and celebrated and remembered um, by others and inspire others. If someone were to cite this instance, this case, as inspiration to carry out violence in the future. How surprising would that be to you? Not at all surprising. In his London apartment, Veltman said he had been spending 12 hours a day or more consuming online conspiracy theories. On that sheet of paper, he had written down speeds and percentages, listing the likelihood of injury or death if a vehicle struck a pedestrian. Then on two separate occasions, in broad daylight on June 6, 2021, the court heard Veltman drove by groups of Muslims in London and again felt compelled to attack them. When he spotted the Ufsals, he said he could no longer resist the urge. Speeding towards a young boy, teenager Yumna, her mother Medea, grandmother Talat, and father Salman. I turned around, he recounted, stepped on the gas, and drove at them. The jury was shown pictures of the crash site with a road sign smashed to the ground. Members of the Muslim community sitting in the courtroom for the trial could at times be heard sobbing. What we, I think, in the community are really asking for is justice in the fullest sense. I think there is confidence. Uthman Quick speaks for the National Council of Canadian Muslims. 
They've kept in touch with family members of the victims. I don't want to speak on behalf of the family in any, any sense, but you can only imagine the difficulty of having to uh, listen to some of the, the details that have come out uh, during the trial. In the witness box, Veltman insisted he never had a plan to kill, and his goal wasn't to intimidate all Muslims. He was 20 years old at the time and testified he was depressed and paranoid, influenced by a strict fundamentalist Christian upbringing. A much different version of Veltman spoke openly to a police detective hours after the attack. It was terrorism. I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna like, I'm not gonna try to get a lighter sentence by saying it was just murder, not terrorism. And there's more. The jury wasn't shown the part of this interview where Veltman said he first considered a terrorist attack when he was 13. In this parking lot, less than five minutes after he ran over the Ufzal family, Veltman approached a taxi driver and ordered him to call 911. It's me, I, it was me. It was me, it was me that did it. Now come arrest me. He put his hands on his head and got down on his knees. Veltman's future now is up to the jury. So, Thomas, I gather you have a bit more information that the jury did not have access to. Yeah, at least on two occasions last year, Adrian, according to a forensic psychiatrist's report, Veltman openly spoke about his plan to plead guilty. Dr. Julian Goger wrote that in August 2022, and again three months later, Veltman told him he intended to plead guilty. Something changed because this past September, Veltman in this courthouse pleaded not guilty to four counts of first degree murder and one count of mm. attempted murder. And here we are now with the jury deliberating. So can we talk possible outcomes for a moment? What do you see? Yeah, the defense insists that uh, the jury should consider lesser charges of second degree murder or even manslaughter. But the Crown says this was certainly first degree murder. And uh, in her instructions to the jury today, the judge laid out two pathways for Veltman to be convicted of first degree murder. The first pathway is through planning and deliberation. If he planned this ahead of time, then it's first degree murder. If not, uh, the judge said it could be terrorism, according to the Crown's case, which means that Veltman, according to the Crown, carried this out, motivated by white nationalist ideology to send a message to all Muslims that they're not welcome here, Adrian. All right, Thomas Degla in Windsor for us tonight. Thank you. The families of the hostages taken by Hamas remain hopeful they will see them alive. I start every day thinking that by the end of the day, we'll see them. They tell us how they're coping with the ongoing uncertainty. Next. It's an agonizing ordeal for the families of hostages held by Hamas. So you have only this now. Caught in a state of constant dread. I don't even want to start imagining the worst case scenario. But knowing they must cling to hope. We found the strength that we didn't know that we have. Ioana Romiliotis spoke with families in Canada and in Israel to learn about their daily ordeal and their fight to have their loved ones set free. Little was said. That was the point. This is a silent scream, organizers told us. Look at them and don't look away. Many gathered on this day. Healthcare workers calling on the International Red Cross to help the hostages. Aaron Brodutch is here too. A voice for his brother's wife and children, who he says are pawns in a cruel and complicated war. This is a situation that is a violation of human rights. It is a violation of international law. It is something that needs to be decoupled from all the other things in this war. Our best hope is that they're safe underground and they haven't seen sunlight for the last month. And this is kind of the best case scenario. I don't even want to start imagining the worst case scenario um, because I have to stay strong and fight for them. Yeah. 
in the raging conflict and a staggering Palestinian death count. The Israeli hostages are another layer of tragedy. For their family members and the communities standing behind them, these are haunting calls for mercy and for humanity. So many faces, so many empty chairs. This Shabbat table in downtown Toronto was set up as a symbolic reminder that every hostage has a family desperate to get them back. Mayan Zin seems hollowed. She says she's barely slept or eaten in more than a month. Mayan, I know if um, you can try this in English, can you um, tell me what is going through your heart right now? I have a carousel in my heart. Um, one moment I am uh, happy because I think uh, uh, good about my uh, girls. And one moment I uh, cry. 15-year-old Daphna, who loves to sing, and her 8-year-old sister Ella were visiting her ex-husband when they were kidnapped. Zin wanted to share a window into her nightmare. She sent us this video, live streamed by Hamas soldiers. It shows the girls with their father before he, his partner and her son were killed and they were taken. The girls last seen, Zin says, in these photos posted by Hamas. Zin recently made a desperate appeal to Israel and its allies. Rescue my girls or take me to them and let me be a hostage with them too. In another post, she appeals in Arabic to release her girls and for any woman who might be with them to simply hug them until she can. I can't bear the situation, she says thinking that they are alone and nobody's able to take care of them or be with them. As we speak, Zin suddenly gets up and returns holding the pajamas her girls last wore. So I have only this now. Oh, my daughter. So I have a little bit of smell and uh, something to hug. In the uncertainty, there is space for agonizing hope, too. Many of the hostages are elderly who rely on medication for chronic conditions. <laughs> Their families are now part of organized appeals and individual ones. This is Mayan Sigal Koren. She and her sister Geffen Sigal speak to everyone they can. I'm Joanna. Nice to meet you, Geffen. I'm sorry it's the, under these circumstances. Hi, Anna. Nice to meet you. Sigal's mother, Clara, and four other family members are also captive. These interviews aren't easy, she says, but she has to do them. What is it like for you to live with that uncertainty? It's impossible. It's really hard. I feel like I'm surviving. Sometimes when we are fighting for our loved ones, we found the strength that we might don't, don't, didn't know that we have before. Clara Marmon, a former kindergarten teacher who loves to bake, whose partner, Louis Har, loves to dance. Glimmers of lives before, Sigal refuses to give up on them. She and other family even celebrated her mother's 64th birthday, despite and because she wasn't there. This uh, celebration, it's really hard to call it celebration for us because we only celebrate the lives that we think that Everybody might have there, but we don't know if and how she is. And it was really, really hard for us. And But it's important, it's important uh, to do it. And we really want the world not to um, stay aside and to help us to release them. Holding on to the promise of light, it's a daily exercise. Brodach checks in often with his brother, who was helping others when his wife and children were kidnapped. <laughs> Brodach asks how he is. His brother's response says it all. They're still in Gaza. This is Agal, my sister-in-law. She's just uh, an incredible person. She's a flea. 
She's 10. She turned 10 on the day she was kidnapped. She's just a, an adorable, adorable child. She was here for a month in Toronto this summer. Hostage posters of his niece and nephews, boys who loved Minecraft and making messes, seem surreal. Brodutch has taken them to nearly a dozen rallies already and keeps hoping he won't have to anymore. And you're, you're continuing these efforts with that vision in mind because you don't entertain, you won't entertain, we don't want to think about the alternatives. 100%. I, I start every day thinking that by the end of the day we'll see them brought back, 100%. And uh, when my kids ask me when are they going to come back, I say tomorrow. And they say, you say that every day, and I tell them, I am going to keep saying that every day until we get them back. You know, it has to be so hard for these families just to, just to keep it together. Uh, we've seen Hamas release a few, very few hostages. Any, any hint of more about to be released? There are news reports that Qatar is collaborating with the U.S. to strike a deal between Hamas and Israel that would see some 50 hostages released in exchange for a three-day ceasefire. Mm -hmm. And part of the agreement also spells out potentially increasing humanitarian aid into Gaza and releasing some Palestinian women and children who are currently in Israeli prisons. But it's, these are signals. We don't have anything concrete. But it does suggest that there is some movement. And that's a lot for families. Talking is something. But, but in the meantime, what are these families doing? They're keeping up what can only be described as relentless organized pressure. And they are constantly trying to put the narrative out there in the public that the hostages must be removed from the wider conflict, that these are innocent people who are pawns. At the same time, they're, they're doing that with the support of communities in Canada and across the world. And it is a full-time job that they are personally taking on. Aaron Bro, Dutch's par uh, family in Israel, is camping out every day in front of military government, in front of military and government buildings. And others are doing countless interviews or constantly posting on social media, all in an effort to keep the story alive, to mm -hmm. keep compassion alive, but more than anything, to keep the pressure on Israel and its allies to bring these people home. All right, Joanna, thank you. You're welcome. Here's another story where the stakes are life and death. With British Columbia losing its fight against fatal overdoses, Ian checked out a group that says it is saving lives with illegally obtained drugs. So for our heroin, we always use red bags, and the meth is in green bags, and the cocaine is in clear bags. It is an activist group pushing for change. And back in September, co-founder Jeremy Callicum invited us to watch him package their version of Safer Supply. This is North America's first cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine compassion club. Though not supervised by any medical staff, the drugs here were tested at a university, carefully packaged with detailed labels from the precise contents to a warning. This kind of program, if it were to expand, what would the result be? What, what would the net change be? Obviously, there'd be less deaths, um, there'd be less overdoses, there'd be less of attacks on our healthcare system, less of, of attacks on policing. So Ian also looks at a program offering prescription fentanyl to hard drug users, and he'll ask BC's Minister of Mental Health and Addictions why the province isn't moving more quickly on safer supply. That is coming your way Friday on The Breakdown. Next, a near disaster on the tarmac. There's like an old Asian lady sitting right next to me and she, I could see her just get off her seat. We were like, wait, what's happening? Are we going to die? The heart stopping landing and the passengers inside in our moment. An Ontario man captured this video of a plane teetering from one side to the other, avoiding tragedy as it landed at Toronto Pearson Airport on Monday. So passengers inside were jostled around, some being lifted right out of their seats. The breathtaking close call is our moment. Air Canada, 40, Whoa. Departure, 1288. For the last several years, I've been going to the airport to take pictures, and I've never seen anything like it. It literally took my breath away because it was terrifying. Everything felt great until the last minute. The last bit, it just like, the entire plane just like tilted on the left, tilted on the right. When it landed, 
everything, everybody sort of like got jolted out their seats a bit. Well, there's like an old Asian lady sitting right next to me and she, I could see her just get off her seat. We were like, wait, what's happening? Are we going to die? Whoa. I've never seen a plane rock so suddenly on landing. My heart sort of almost skipped a beat for a minute. It was extremely rough, but it went by so quickly. Once I saw the nose touch down, I uh, definitely breathed a sigh of relief. That was... Kind of too. Terrifying. But right after it was like nothing had happened, everybody in the plane decided together that, hey, let's just ignore it. Like, if nothing happened, let's just keep go home. It just showed um, some really, really good piloting skills to save the plane in that situation. Even with very skilled pilots and very great airplanes, a lot of times we're still at the mercy of the weather. You know, no one's hurt. We got, we, he landed the plane safely. Can't wait to do that again next month. <laughs> Pretend like nothing's happening. So apparently that was wind shear. Uh, this was a flight all the way from Tokyo. And full credit to the flight attendants who remained incredibly calm. Important to everyone there. Good on you. From all of us here at The National, thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app. Subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrian Arsenault. Take care.